The sun is shining, the birds are singing, and summer is very much on its way. A brand new week is upon us too, and what better way to kick it off than by regaling you with more fascinating stories and insights into the lives of professional hockey players with a brand new episode of Inside the Circle, the podcast. This week, we are joined by the Queen of the Cuppa in Emily de Frond and the goal machine that is Anna Toman. Welcome to Inside the Circle, girls, and uh, thank you for joining us. You're so welcome. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't quite catch your, your reaction there, Anna, to being called a goal machine, but uh, <laughs> I can guess what it was. Uh, I don't think I'll ever get used to it. <laughs> um, so when this podcast is released, we'll be entering our ninth week of sort of lockdown, but it's actually been a little bit longer since the, the GB women's and men's teams were sort of all together training. Um, how has it been that you've actually, have you found it being apart for so long? Is this the longest you've ever been apart since you came into the programme? Yeah. Isn't it? No, that, I think the longest we've probably been away is like three, four weeks. And that's usually like at Christmas or after a, a tournament, really, after, like summer break. But this is all a bit um, surreal for us lot, I feel. I mean, not seeing Anna for that long is obviously, you know, a big struggle to me. So any excuse to get her on Cupper and Anetta or to join her on the uh, podcast <laughs> to get my fix. <laughs> but yeah, 100%. This is, this is, without doubt, the biggest, longest period of time that we've spent away as a squad. How how are you guys managing to to keep in touch? What sort of things are you doing, either sort of in some small groups or as a, as a big team we've done um quite a few different things so we've kind of worked as like one week on one week off because you don't want to overload each other because obviously we didn't know how long we were going to be in this for um so we've had a few team quizzes which have been really fun um we've had a f uh, we had a team baking session um we've had a few like optional like catch-ins with a cup of tea in the mornings um, and then we've had more like official stuff with coaches, with our psychologist, um, just to keep us ticking over, um, chatting about specific things um, that will hopefully help us going forward whenever we eventually get back together. So it's been nice to just have that contact every now and again, um, just brings you back to reality a little bit and to see everyone's face. So it's been really good. Who's uh, particularly strong at the quizzes or who's a, who's a good quiz master? Well, we've got one of our quiz masters here with us, so I'm sure she'll be a bit biased. But actually, Toman's quiz as quiz master was very strong. Um, a good variety of rounds on show. Um, and our very first quiz was, um, <laughs> was hilarious. You might have seen a few photos online, but it was led by Sarah Robertson. And the girl is honestly one in a million. She's an absolute nut job. And she was dressed head to toe in fancy dress. Um, we all had to bring props to the quiz. Um, we had to basically, if you got a correct answer, you'd have to put on a hat or you had to put on some glasses or any, like one of the props that she told us to, to bring. And basically we spent probably over an hour, hour and a half, all looking absolutely ridiculous because obviously no one got I think it was like five straight answers that were correct um, to end the quiz. But they've, they've been very entertaining, to be fair. Um, and that's someone speaking um, that is not very good at quizzes. I have still quite enjoyed taking part. So the quiz masters must be doing something right. Um, my so, quiz was a bit yeah. easier, though. So my quiz was on, on our team. So we did. So me and Ez put it together. And we had different rounds. So we had some facts, hockey facts, some interesting facts some baby photos and then we did a round that was old Facebook statuses which oh. yeah it really brought out a few crackers some that like people didn't even know themselves that they'd put it um so it was very entertaining that was very entertaining that was the highlight I think I mean who knew that I was Facebook status in in 
2011 or 10 or hopefully earlier about the Eurovision Song Contest. Like that was <laughs> like who knew? Like that was a thing. Like my street cred went straight down after that round, but it was very entertaining. I'll give you that. Do you guys like not use the memories app on Facebook where you can like see what you posted th- on this day six years ago and delete all the embarrassing old statuses? Well, I think everyone will be doing that now. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't it? Um, people were worried because their profiles were not set to private. So you could literally go through everyone's statuses and bring out some absolute crackers. Yeah. Uh, so highlight or something. <laughs> or, or that, or it could be a disaster. But did you ever have the um, time hop app on your phone so that or what I used to have that and every morning I'd wake up and think oh five years ago I was at uni like with face paint on looking absolutely ridiculous or you know 10 years ago I looked exactly the same because I still look like a baby like it's I, I deleted that straight from my phone because I was literally like you know what the past is the past for a reason <laughs> Let me see that. <laughs> yeah is that something you guys ever worry about as professional athletes that something that even even sort of that's, that looked and um, was innocent at the time may may come back and be like oh blimey if someone gets hold of that I don't really want them to see that or is that not something you you think too much about yeah we do think about it and we've had um almost like seminars on it before because even something that at the time was innocent we know how things can be twisted um, sometimes in the media so it's important for us obviously to portray a certain image we do want people to know the real us but we're professional athletes at the end of the day so even if it was in our past it's not something you really want to be brought up so it is important for us to keep those things private and in the past um, so I, I remember I had it once at Birmingham Uni and um, we had a seminar on it and someone came in and he had searched all our Facebooks and was putting them all on this board, like old photos. And at that point it wasn't as important. I was a uni student, but still just for like strangers to see um, was, it wasn't very nice. And I think it was then that I put it all to private. Um, So then obviously on Instagram and Twitter and stuff, we, it's, we have to be setting a certain example. So only certain stuff go, should go on there for the public to see. What I do like, though, and, and this is the case for both teams, though, is that there's still there's still good levels of fun and good levels of banter, especially from someone like Amy Tennant or Sarah Robertson. And even Sarah Jones, actually, I've noticed of late, like you do also show your personalities as well and you do have a, a good laugh. Is that something that, um, again, do you guys sort of think much about or is it is it just something that happens naturally? I think it's one of those, like, social media, I'm a big fan and not many... Like, I mean, not everyone has the same opinions on social media as I do, um, but I think it's a fantastic platform to not only um, showcase our sport and showcase our squad and what we're all about, um, both on and off the pitch, but as well as individuals and um, be able to show, you know, your interests outside of hockey, your passions, you know, whether it's cooking, whether it's, you know, playing other sports, whatever. I think social media is really powerful in that. And with you know, hockey being a sport played by so many people um, with such a huge following on social media. Actually, I think it's a benefit for us to use that as a platform um, to showcase what we're all about as a squad and as individuals. And you yourself, Em, have taken social media by storm recently with Cuppa and Anatta. And if anyone's watched that or or even hasn't watched that, the interaction between Anna and Emily is brilliant. And you can see the chemistry between the two of you. You can see how well you know each other. So how long actually have you, the two of you, been friends? Because it, it, when, when you're talking to each other, it feels like you must have known each other forever. So we first met, we didn't play under 16s together. So we first met when I was top age of under 18s and M. So M's obviously the year below. So M would have been 16, 17, and I would have been 17, 18. Um, So we've played together since then. Um, So we got to know each other through playing juniors, but then we also went to the same university. Um, So a lot of memories from there. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah, so we've known each other quite a long time. Do you remember the first day when you met, or do you remember sort of initial impressions of each other at all? 
I do, I do. Well, yeah. So I remember, um, so obviously in the National Age Group squads, most of our um, training camps and training was based at Lillishaw. And um, I remember like the first training camp where us as like under 17s, the younger year, um, kind of were meeting all of the older lot. And I knew Anna Toman because Anna Toman was like, one of the big dogs in that age group. So I was like, all right, okay, like this should be interesting. And obviously like she was brilliant at that point. But um, one of the first training sessions actually, which I've got to say this because it's got to be let out to the whole world. But actually we were practicing short corners and everyone was doing their little bit. Like, I don't know why I'd never deflected the ball at short corners in my life, like running into the deflections. But I was like, yeah, go for it. Um, Toman was on the top of the day, um, getting ready to let loose that, that slap and hit that we've all come to know and love right now in international hockey. Um, but yeah, she wellied the ball and I somehow deflected the ball into the goal with my thumb. And I knew, like, it was a goal, I promise. It was a goal. I remember it really well. It flew into the back of the net. But I looked down and my, my thumb instantly, like, doubled in size. And I was in agony. And obviously, it was the first time that I'd met some of these girls. Um, one of my first under-18 training sessions, I was like, I can't come off like a wuss now. Like, I can't go over to the... I think the physio um, um, at the time was actually Ros Ralph, Ralphie's wife. Um, so like small world but anyway I was like I can't go over to Roz and show them I've hurt my thumb I can't play on so I carried on carried on obviously like it was in agony every time I touched the ball the uh, vibration up my stick I couldn't let on to Toman couldn't let on to Roz couldn't let on to anyone um, it was only until I broke my thumb two or three years later I got an x-ray and they said you'd actually broken your thumb before and I said well I know when that was it was when Anna Toman smashed the ball at me in a short corner the girl didn't even realize and I only told her last year fuming so I have really fond memories actually of the first few times that me and Toman met she broke my thumb <laughs> do you remember that Anna I she remember it literally I thought when she told me I like I didn't really believe you to begin with. I was like, that didn't happen. And then I was like, well, I must have. <laughs> Wait, I'm so good at hiding, hiding a pain that none of us ever knew. Um, but yeah, I felt really bad. <laughs> yeah. I should have stopped there. I should have been like, you know what? That's a sign. We shouldn't be friends. But however many years later, 10 years later, I mean, we're living together, so. <laughs> How did you? How did that come up in conversation? Then did you literally just turn around and say to Anna, "Anna, do you know that you once broke my thumb?" Or, or is there a context behind it? I don't actually remember. No, I don't. I don't. I can't remember. But I did make sure that she knew <laughs> that I broke my thumb and that it was her, and that it really hurt. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I remember. Sorry. It <laughs> it's the far end at Ullishaw National um, Sports Centre. Cracks in short corners, time and smashed it. I deflected it with my thumb and I broke it. <laughs> Welcome to International Hockey. Hi, I'm Emily DeFrond and you're listening to Inside the Circle. What are those what are those nags camps like at sixteens and eighteens when you sort of you, you're coming together with people from from all over the country and it's as close to a sort of almost professional setup as as you're going to get at that age like how much of a difference is it compared to to what you're used to and, and how does it does it take a little while to get used to or did you just thrive and love it straight away I think particularly when you're younger so I remember like 15 16 more so it was very daunting because you didn't know anyone you knew the people from like your region um but you didn't really know anyone else um so I remember like my first trials when I was 15 at Lily Shaw and I mean this is showing my age it was actually on the other pitch that's now I think it's used for archery now so I don't think you ever played on archery? that is it 
Yeah, well, last time I was there. Did you ever play on that pitch? No. Yeah. So, I mean, it was better because it was right beside the building. So you didn't have to do the long, the long walk down that stone drive. But um, I remember it being very daunting back then. And I think, I can't remember if it was one of the first things we did or one of the last things. It was always fitness, which was, I mean we don't like it now, never mind then. So I remember always being really nervous, but then as you go up the age group, you tend to see the same people um, each year coming back. So then, and also once you go to tournaments and stuff, you get to know people so easily because you've all, you're all sharing this common interest, which is hockey. Um, so I remember like, as you got older, then that's when you start to make the friendships um, and it just got easier each year um, going. Um, I will admit I dreaded going to Lillishaw sometimes it seemed to have like its own like bubble of weather and it was miserable a lot of the time but yeah I mean some of my best friends are from hockey growing up so yeah it's it's helped me in <laughs> a lot of ways it's crazy isn't it because I would actually love to know how many days we all spent at Lillishaw from the like under 16s all the way through to under 21s we honestly spent so long there I mean we'd have like death camps that we'd um yeah do you remember that one we did was that under 21s yeah we had um so obviously you get you get sent an email about roughly what you're going to do and I think it was like so they're normally over weekends only about three days but this one in particular I think was four days I think and, four. yeah and like the fourth day it was really unclear what we were doing but we were leaving like earlier on like around lunchtime so we had this one thing in the morning that they wouldn't really tell us what it was and we were all very apprehensive about it um which was it was weird for us to like stay overnight for then one more session the next day um, and I remember them explaining it to us. So it was kind of, it was fitness, but they tried to make it a lot more fun. So it was almost like a boot camp. So we had these different teams and these different tasks. So for example, one of them was pushing a car, like say 50 meters or something. Um, so there were those sort of tasks. And I remember them explaining it to us and it just sounded horrendous and it was so difficult, but it was actually really fun because it was hard, but it's not like, running doing a double doggy or something on a hockey pitch it was actually like really different stuff so it was actually really fun and of course we all got so competitive you didn't um wasn't one of the challenges you had to carry someone like pitch limbs and didn't yeah. someone really get dropped or did get dropped on their head i think so but i i remember someone when we were pushing the car someone fell because we yeah. who, who was it why does giselle come to mind I don't know who and because we were doing it on like stones I mean it was really slippy and they found them, like grazed all of their legs. It was, it, I mean the thing of that they were unique honestly these death camps and mm. you'd have at least one every year um and I mean the dreaded walk from the accommodation to the pitch that would just make ten things ten times worse honestly like as Toman said, Lillishaw literally had its own bubble. And once you entered Lillishaw, that was it. It was hockey, hockey, terrible weather and pain, basically. <laughs> there was good food, really good food. Um, I mean... I remember, what, what festival? Was it V-Fest that was near it? Uh, yeah. I remember one year, um, some of my friends were at V-Fest and it was it was actually like one summer that it was really hot and we had a really busy summer at Lillishaw, like we're there all the time. And I remember one camp in particular, some of my friends were at V-Fest and we were like, obviously like slaving away on the hockey pitch and we could hear like the bass from the festival. And I was like, oh. I remember that. We were warming up and we could hear V-Fest going on down the road. But... <laughs> Yeah, we would have preferred to be at Lillishaw anyway. We did have fun. It was ba it was banter. The, like, the yeah. whole experience, looking back. You weren't at Lillishaw all the time, though, as, as you alluded to there. You would sometimes go away and play games and, and tournaments. What was that like, I guess, being 16, 17, 18, and you're, you're going abroad to play against the best that other nations have to offer? It's amazing. It, like, to be fair, those... 
those first few camps that you play, whether it's under 16, under 18, under 21, the first times that you play for England or, or GB, like you will remember those moments forever. And, you know, to be at that age and be able to go and play in a different country against, you know, the best European teams um, in the world in terms of hockey, um, it's something that you feel so grateful for. And, you know, it is really, really special. You think it's like the biggest thing. And it is at that time. It's the biggest thing. You, you get all, all, you know, so nervous. You don't feel nerves like it uh, any other time. You know, your friends and your family are all really supportive. Um, some, like, some of us are lucky enough to have family members fly out to see, uh, watch, watch some of the games. And I mean, the parents seem to have just as much fun. Um, as us lot but it is amazing it's the whole experience it's the experience on the field obviously your first taste of international hockey but as Toman said it's the friendships that you get um, off the pitch that I mean that will stay with you for a lifetime um, and even at that young age you know I've got such fond memories from my my involvement within the national age group squads um, so, so many good memories looking back how about for you, Anna? What what was it like for you? Yeah, just echo what Em said. It was, I remember being really nervous when we, like I said, when I was 15, 16 doing it. But um, I was lucky enough as well that my parents always came out to support. So I think that helped a little bit that you could see like a friendly face when you were out there. But yeah, it, it was an amazing experience at such a young age to be able to go to all these different countries and play against some of the best players in the world um yeah I, it was it, I always have fond memories but I also think it helped me like grow up quite a bit as well and I became quite independent from it um so I know like a lot of people almost grow up when they go to university because they have to start cooking and cleaning for themselves but I think like it also helped me gain independence um we obviously looked after a little bit more than what we are now when we go away but you still you're still going away without your family which not many people did at that age um, and you go through long periods of time of not seeing them so it helped me in loads of different ways and it they were always always had so much fun obviously if we won it was better but I remember even some of the times where we lost but what you do off the pitch and the people that you're meeting and stuff always you always had great experiences <laughs> You can listen to Inside the Circle on all your usual podcast channels. Speaking of sort of off the pitch incidents, in the last podcast or the last couple of podcasts, we had George and and Dan Fox talking about sort of what what happens at like senior World Cups. But do sort of those sort of those mishaps or those those pranks do they happen at younger age groups as well? Yeah, of course they do. Yeah, hundred percent. It's all part of a team sport, isn't it? It's all good fun. Like, um, like as Taman said, like at that age as well, you you kind of all chuck together from every single um, side of the country, different backgrounds, you know, different personalities, but you come together in this team, and I think the team unity, the morale, just as with any sport, really, it just clicks straight away and. I do. I have so many memories. Whether it's you know, scare cam like going into people's rooms and <laughs> scaring them, like just shouting, scaring. Amy Tennant was always a good one at that. Um, a good, a good one to scare. Or did she do the scaring? Well, Tato, were you Han's roommate in Spain? Yes. Yeah, so, I well, yeah, because that was the thing. I didn't react. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. In, so this is actually seniors. So this was 2017, I think. 20, the summer of 2017. Yeah. 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 And we, um, we went to Spain to play a few test matches um, versus Spain. And we played, was it in Madrid? Madrid, yeah. Because it was yeah. that okay. whole uni. Yeah. We, we stayed in the university halls. And I mean... It wasn't the nicest, but we made them. It was fine. Uh, I mean, yeah, Laura Unsworth was looking for Airbnbs the minute we uh, 
<laughs> we got there. But I don't know about that. We all survived. It was great. Um, but obviously, we had quite a bit of spare time, as you do on all of these camps. And uh, myself and Amy Tennant were rooming together, and Toman and Han were rooming together. So me and Tennant were just bored. And I think that day we'd taken over the Mercy and Hockey Instagram account. So we were trying really hard to find different ways to create content that will, you know, show the squad in a good light. Um, so we went on a scare cam, you know, routine along the corridor. We started at the very end and we worked across everyone's rooms trying to scare them on, on camera to get a good reaction. <laughs> so <laughs> we eventually made it to Toman and Han's room, which was like at the other end of the corridor. So bear in mind that the whole other like corridor had like heard screams, shouts, whatever, laughs. Uh, these two were oblivious in their own world as always. Um, Toman was we were watching a really like really oh. bad document. Like me and Hannah are into we like watching like murder documentaries, and we were like deeply discussing this some sort of murder documentary. <laughs> So I do, so do apologise, it was terrible timing from me and Tennant. But uh, so Tyman was sat on her bed, which is like closest to the door, and Ham was sitting on like the windowsill, up against the wall, um, like all fine. And <laughs> Tennant was behind me recording. And I just walked into the room really quietly and just screamed. I was like, oh my God. And then, and then, Toman, as chilled as you like, the girl is literally so relaxed. I've never known anyone like her. She's just like unfazed, whatever. Han, on the other hand, sitting on the windowsill, she like all got all jitty, like, whoa, what happened? Big jump, was holding her phone. Her phone flew out of her hand. Little did I know the window was open behind her. <laughs> so it nearly went out the window behind her. Honestly, if I if Han's phone flew out that window, mine and Tenant's lives would not be worth living. I don't think I don't think she'd still be talking to me right now. But luckily enough, <laughs> it didn't fly out the window. Toman probably helped because she was just sat there like chilled as ever. Um, but it was hilarious. It was so funny. I, m I remember Han got some good airtime when she jumped off the bed, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> Unreal. I've never seen it. Honestly, I'm not exaggerating. I've never seen anything like it. It was so entertaining. All caught on camera for everyone to um, to enjoy. Uh, what about the two of you? Did the two of you ever ever share or anything like that at Nags? Yeah, so we shared... Um, was it our first tournament? Yeah. We, yeah, it was. So, again, we hadn't really spoke to each other that much. <laughs> I'd obviously only just broke Em's thumb. <laughs> so... Um, so I remember we went away, was it, was it Spain? Valencia. Valencia, wasn't it? Um, and we were sharing and I remember like, some, when you share with someone you don't know for the first time, particularly when you're younger, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a bit like, oh, okay, it's going to be a bit awkward for a little bit. But I mean, that did not last long, like at all. We got on so well. Um, so we bonded over watching... Um, pimp my ride <laughs> I mean that shows how long ago this was because obviously you're in Spain there's not many um English programs on so I think they had MTV so we would always just like skip through to that and pimp my ride was on all the time and we literally spent however long we were there for a week and a half however long we spent <laughs> every day watching that program it was just ridiculous <laughs> Honestly, like, if, if anyone asked, where's Em and Toman during that <laughs> trip, they'd probably know we'd be in our room watching Pimp My Ride. I've, I've never watched a programme back-to-back so much in my whole entire life. And I can't say I've probably ever watched it since, but, uh, yeah, brilliant. We kept ourselves busy, 100%. The only TV programme that was in English in Spain. Perfect. Pimp My Ride. <laughs> we, didn't have we didn't have Netflix and stuff back in those days, so yeah. we made the most of it. Have you shared um, rooms much since, or is that sort of the one abiding memory you've got? No, we've we've shared. We've shared in um, we shared at the Commonwealth Games, um, which was really good fun. And actually, I think with the whole time difference situation and jet lag, um, 
for me personally, that could have been an issue. But because Toman sleeps all the time, <laughs> honestly, the girl sleeps. She naps every second of the day. She's so chilled. So that was perfect for me, the Commonwealth Games. She really helped me conquer jet lag. <laughs> How do, you, how do you get away with that then, Anna? Because there are certain people that when they're napping in between sessions or something or on the plane, they always get shown on Instagram. I'm thinking largely of Sarah Robertson here. But Anna, you seem to get away with that. Yeah, I actually don't know how I do. Like, I've even been guilty of sometimes if we've had a, a longer journey from the hotel to the match. So I remember one in particular was um, New Zealand in the World League final. Um sometimes the journey with with traffic would take 40 minutes so this is on on our way to an international match and i would have a sleep on the bus but and i remember it was it was danny Kerry that was coaching us at the time and i remember having a conversation with him and telling him so don't worry if you see me asleep on the bus like as soon as i wake up i'll obviously be fine and i'll be ready to go but Sometimes you've just got to nap and I don't know how I don't get caught. I remember in New Zealand, actually, because I, I felt bad to begin with sleeping on the way. Um, so I'd kind of I just put my headphones in and people often just like sit by yourself on the bus anyway, because there's loads of seats. And I remember I would always just like pretend I was almost just staring out the window, but I would just like have my eyes closed like the whole time. <laughs> Outrageous. She gets away with murder. Honestly, it's like, oh, I'm not going to sit next to Toman on the on the bus because she'll probably sleep and ignore me the whole trip. So if I want to chat, oh, my boy, they like the plague. Um, but it's so fun. It's, it is a thing. It is a thing. The girl is so chilled. I also remember someone else doing something similar. Do you remember Zoe Shipley? She'd always say, I remember um, it was in South Africa, World League 3, and um, she'd do exactly the same. Like, close her eyes, fall asleep on the way to a match. And I'm like, so, like, are you all right? And she's like, oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just resting my eyes. Like, I need to have this time to just, like, make myself ready and alert for the game. And I was like, blimey, Zoe, if that's what you need, you go for it. And I think Toman's exactly the same, probably 10 times worse. <laughs> What's it like, then, travelling to either a next game or an international game? Because you, you have a lot of different personalities and a lot of people have their own sort of ways with preparing for a game so do you have like set people that you'll always travel with or does it sort of vary between each tournament and like so you, you you know that Anna likes to be left alone or there's some people that like to be sort of more active and a bit chatty how, how does that sort of work in your team um yeah I, I mean everyone uh, kind of is aware of other people's routines. Um, so you get some people that like to listen to music, some people like to rest their eyes, um, <laughs> some people like to chat. Um, and to be honest, you kind of get into that routine on a trip uh, that you tend to sit in the same seat um, every bus journey um, and do the similar sort of thing. So like, for example, you know the front row seat, that's Laura Unsworth and Nick White when, um, and she graced us with her presence in terms of them two old dogs will be at the front. Then you've got, you know, Lily or Saz, Han probably at the back. Then us two will probably be in front, tome and asleep, me listening to my music. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, you tend to kind of sit in a similar sort of um, sim similar seat every single f uh, journey. I think that's fair to say, isn't it? Yeah. And then you had the small group of people that like to, they don't want to listen to music and they want to talk to each other. So I think it's like Crofty, is, uh, is. so they all then sit together so they can have a chat on the way because no one else wants to talk. <laughs> so no. it's quite good. Everyone just gets to know each other's um, routines and stuff and everyone respects them. So yeah, you just kind of fall into place. So we're nearing the end of our Zoom time, so I think we'll, we will split this into two podcasts. But there's one more question I wanted to ask, um, sort of related to the nags, sort of roommate stuff here. And um, it was a note that you put down when we were sort of planning this podcast, and I didn't really understand. But you've just, you've just put down language barriers with each other and each other's parents. <laughs> <laughs> 
What does that mean? Such a thing. This is such a thing. Okay. I think it's better coming from you, this. I think it's hilarious when you say it. <laughs> well, did this happen more when we lived together? I mean, it's happened from the get-go, let's be honest. <laughs> I don't know if this falls into us living together. But there's one particular story that I'm thinking of. Tell that, 100 percent Shall I tell it now or shall I tell it in the, in, in the next one? Tell it now and then we can just use it to say, oh, if you want to hear more stories like this, listen next week. So... Obviously, Em has a very strong Essex accent, and my mum is from Northern Ireland, so she's still got, lived here for years, but still got quite a strong Irish accent. So I remember one conversation in particular, um, and I spoke to mum about this the other day, that mum said something, it was when we were moving into our new house, and mum said mirror, but Irish people pronounce it mer, so it doesn't really, really absolutely no idea what my mum was saying and I could kind of like see the confusion on Em's face and I just remember the confusion um and I just let it play out and just but I just remember Em being so confused and then I think it was I don't know if it was the same conversation but it was similar time that Em you said something about shock you said you were you were pale as in your skin was pale so Em pronounces that pow so, so, so Emma would be like, I'm, I'm so pow, which sounds like P-O-W to me. And then again, just the opposite way around. I remember like complete blankness on my mum's face. And my mum was like, you're pow. What do you mean you're pow? <laughs> so, <laughs> I love Janice to bits, but sometimes it does get in the way. <laughs> I can like understand each of them, but I just kind of let the confusion play out. And they're both like, what? <laughs> So yeah, Taiman's the uh, middle one, mum, really. <laughs> and if you want to hear more great stories like this of Emily and Anna living together, then make sure you tune into Inside the Circle when we return next week. <laughs> Inside the Circle, the podcast, will return on Monday the 25th of May for a second episode with Emily and Anna. This time, the discussion centres around them sharing a house and includes stories of Luther, deck chairs and screaming babies. In the meantime, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on all of your usual providers.